upstairs. The absence of a pen can be a pain. <laughs> <laughs> so now we begin the 17th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. This chapter is literally not a very long chapter, so we should, will not try to go too long today. In the 16th chapter, Krishna ends by contrasting the divine and the demonic creatures. He says that the divine, those are the divine nature, they, they follow Shastra, they have faith and they follow Shastra. Now, Shastra can refer to scripture, but like yesterday we discussed, they Shastra, they follow discipline, they follow regulation. Now, the other demoniac, they to have lack faith and they reject Shastra. This is the two extremes. Now, immediately, see this is almost the the 16th chapter seems to be like a very black and white picture of human nature. There are divine people and the demoniac. People. <coughs> so it's like a one zero kind of depiction. Now much of reality actually exists in shades of grey. And Krishna gives this very seriously black and white kind of picture. It, it is question begging. Question begging means Somebody makes a statement and that raises a question in the audience mind. And so, uh, if some, somebody doesn't ask a question, then that will bring a question in the speaker's mind. You know, are people even listening to what I'm saying? Okay. So if I say I want to speak three points and I speak only two points, then and nobody asks what is the third point? And then I'll say what is the point of my speaking only? <laughs> so like that, Krishna speaks a very black and white depiction and immediately Arjuna asks, what about the people who are in between? <coughs> because most of humanity exists in between. So he says, yeah, Shastra with you, they do not follow Shastra specifically. But they have some kind of faith. Bartate Shraddhayan Vitaha Tesha Nishtha Tuka Krishna Sattva Maho Rajasthavaha So, what is the nature of their faith? Basically, people who are in between, not there. No, it was there outside on the table only. On the bed, it was there. Wow. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you for proving me wrong. <laughs> so now Krishna will reply that how do we understand the modes? So this, this chapter is called uh, sorry, how do you understand the people of in between? They have some faith. So for example, across the world we will see that. Somebody might worship some Devata, somebody might worship some, even some Baba who claims to be God. Or who is, they may not claim to be God, but their followers believe them to be God. It's possible. Or somebody might worship nature. Mm -hmm. Somebody might worship, worship some trees, uh, some deity in the trees. Uh, somebody might worship a movie star. It? Somebody might worship a sports player. Now, they're not literally Pudu or Puja. It's, it's a, it's a, you know, in India, apparently, there are 12 temples of Amitabh Bachchan. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Actually, physical temples. Mm -hmm. So, uh, there are people can worship anything and everything. Sometimes they can literally worship in terms of doing puja. But 
worship actually means you make them make that thing the center of your life, isn't it? So this this particular analysis can also apply to the various religious traditions because when the Bhagavad Gita was spoken, Christianity, Judaism, Islam, and all these are not there. The Gita doesn't talk about them specifically, but the Gita uses a framework for looking at this. And the Gita Krishna, Krishna basically says that how do we understand people? He says that how do we understand people's faith? It is by their actions. What do I what is the nature of my faith? How do I know? Or how can you know the nature of my faith? It is by looking at my actions. So Krishna says that. So what we want to know here is the faith. Which mode is it in? So we could say that the faith depends on the mode of the object of worship. So Krishna says it's not that simple. Mm-hmm. That means say somebody might worship some 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 some, some man who claims to be God or who is believed to be God. There are several, several spiritual teachers in India, they themselves never claim to be God. But after they died, their followers made them into God. So there's a difference, those who claim to be God and those who are considered to be God by their followers. And both are not still the same. But either way, uh, how do we know what is the nature of their faith? We can say it's concocted, it's not according to Shastra. Well, that's true. But what does that make it? Like we discussed in scripture, hell is not for non-believers. Not just because you don't believe in Shastra, you have to go to hell. No. If you have some kind of faith. This is, faith is seen through actions. And, one, two, three, okay, four. So generally, in the Bible also, say this, faith is seen, through, they use the word works. Faith is seen through action or works. And what does action refer to? Krishna says basically four things. He says you can look at the food people eat, you can look at the sacrifices that they do, the austerities that they do, yajna, dana and tapa and the charity that they give. By understanding these three things, so anna, yajna, dana and tapa. Why these specific things? Because at one level, food represents, uh, food can literally refer to food and it doesn't refer to food, but food also represents what we take from the world. Ultimately, the most important thing we take from the world is food, isn't it? Uh, what else do we, we need some space to live, we can consume entertainment, we interact with people, there's some sense of gratification there. But the primary thing which we take from the world is food. So the underlying principle of uh, of the Vedic tradition, of Dharma, of Yajna is that there always has to be some kind of reciprocation. If I am in, if I am in some larger hole, I am taking something from that hole and I am giving something back to that hole. So the, now the primary thing that we take is Anna. And then Krishna says, what kind of food do we consume? That can be in Sattvarya Stamas. And he gives characteristics of the food. And he says, by that, that is one parameter to understand the level of a person's faith. So, for example, if somebody considers all of existence to be potential food. <laughs> all of existence is potential food. So that means you know, there are people. Hmm. See, among food, because the most evolved food is say somebody takes prasad. And we will say why prasad is the most evolved kind of food. But see, there is food, everybody needs food. But the food that causes least disruption to other life forms. Hmm? The food that causes literally um, more disruption. The food that causes the most disruption. So based on that, we can understand 
which which person is living more in harmony with nature which person is less in harmony with nature so everybody needs food but i say at a simple level if i am so hungry for food that i break the prasadam queue and i rush forward and take food from the plate and so you will take food from the from the container that i push the container and the container spills over and all the food gets wasted i get my food but nobody else gets food so or at least everybody else gets they have to pick up the food from the earth and ground and take it is dirty just that that's disruptive that's a the gross level disruptive but sattvic rajasic tamasic food is basically classified broadly speaking on the basis of disruptiveness and now how much disruption does it cost to the world that is difficult to know for each individual but he says that the food that is disruptive will also be disruptive the world is also disruptive to our body and that's why that is too hot too spicy too burn too much burning it causes disruption internally also so krishna classifies food like that now i'm not going to go into the specifics of food over here we have other discussions about plethora of food now prasad will be the highest krishna doesn't mention krishna of our prime sattva rajas and tamas over here but the sattva food is that which is least disruptive to our body hmm? tamasic food is that is most disruptive to the body so mm, disruption to the body and the body is like a microcosm microcosm means that is a small sample microcosm of the universe prabhupad says that in the universe there are the there are various elements earth water fire air ether and then the body also is earth water fire and so body like a microcosm so the food that causes the least disruption that means that person understands it also indicate the level of faith that the universe is arranged in such a way that i can get my food without house cause yet we don't need it to hurt others but somebody believes that existence is all hostile to me and to get my food i have to destroy so is it true well to some extent yes in the animal world especially bhagavad also says jeevo jeevasya jeevana one life form is a uh, is a food for another life form but we humans don't have to live like that so that is what we take from the universe that, that indicates our level of faith so for example if i am working in a company and i don't believe that the company is paying me fair then what will i try to do i try to steal from the company and if i don't believe that the company is going to be stable for a long time if i believe that tomorrow the company now will exist then again also i'll try to steal from it now before the company goes down let me get as much as i can so basically a disruption if our understanding of the universe is proper then we won't have we will we'll see that my needs don't have to disrupt the whole system that's the basic point of food what kind of food we eat and then these three items yagya dana and tapo they are talked about many times in the bhagavad gita there are three fundamental activities of religious virtue tapa is what charity or said dana is charity and yagya is sacrifice. sacrifice excellent so what why these three particular activities what is their significance in the in the majority of the remaining chapter krishna will talk about that these three activities can be used as parameters for judging what is the level of faith of a person so what kind of sacrifices they perform what kind of charity they give what kind of austerities they do so now to understand this the significance of these three particular activities one of the fundamental teachings of the vedic tradition is that we humans are situated in three circles so these three circles are first is the body this is the adhi adhyatmik isn't it is the adhyatmik circle then second is society that is the adhi bhautik and then third is nature hmm now practically speaking also you know the soul is in the body the body is situated so society and we are in, within the earth within the ecosystem that is adhi daivik so now this is a fundamental understanding 
and we need each of these circles for sustenance. With, if our body collapses, we can't function. If society is filled with violence or crime or something like that, we can't function. If nature leads to earthquakes or tornadoes or extreme heat, extreme cold, we can't function. So all three circles are needed for us, basic survival. And not only that, all three circles, they provide us sustenance in The body is our basic tool for function. In society, we go about and do our activities, we are social creatures, we need to live in the community. And nature provides us air, heat, light, the universal utilities. So these three holes, we can say they are required for our surviving and for our functioning. That's from a positive perspective. They are needed. Now from a negative perspective, all three can give us klesha. The body can have diseases. From society there can be, as I said, there can be, there can be terrorism, there can be robbery, there can be dishonesty. So these are the adhyatmic, adhivautik and then adhidaivik klesha. So in many traditional Vedic ceremonies, at the end of the ceremony, especially the Chanda Mantra chanting, they say, Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. So one reason for the three Shanti is that it is actually invocation of these three kleshas. Om Adhyatmik Klesh Shanti. Om Adhivati Klesh Shanti. Om Adhidaivi Klesh Shanti. So all of these can cause agitation and all of these require pacification and these three activities, Tapa is actually our way, what we take from the body, we give back to the body, that we give back, so we take from the body, we take, means that we have desires and the body is a tool for in getting energy and things like that, we do things. So we return to the body through tapa. That means when we do regulation, when we do austerity, the body gets some rest. Like say an ekadashi, if we fast, then the digestive system gets some rest. So now that may feel troubling for us to some extent, but actually it's unpleasant for the mind, but the body, nowadays there is a lot of research about the benefits of intermittent fasting. It's considered one of the best ways to both lose weight and improve health. So, there's an old Egyptian proverb. He says, you live on 25% of what you eat. And the remaining 75% of what you eat lives your doctor. <laughs> <laughs> so, the idea is that because most people eat so much, so there are so many diseases, and that's how the doctors survive. Mm -hmm. So, now the exact percentage is not true, but the point is it's almost universal to recognize that fasting is actually very good for health. So, basically, the body gets time to, uh, to use a, like a physical metaphor. You know, if a machine is constantly working, then if an office is constantly functioning, then you can't clean it, you don't have time to maybe revamp it, re restore it, uh, renovate it, whatever. So that the body cleans itself, rests itself and oils itself in the time of fasting. So tapa is the way we harmonize with the body. And tapa can incorporate many things like yoga sanas. It's also, it's a, to some extent, like tapa. If you most of yogis, they perform, most people, they perform austerities. In tradition, the yogis would sit in a particular pose. That pose is an austerity. So <coughs> tapa is the way we return we harmonize ourselves with the body. Then, Daan is the way we harmonize ourselves with society. We take so many things from society and we are meant to return them. So, now of course you say I am paying taxes. But taxes are more or mandatory. His austerity is like, like this is all each of these things are meant to be more voluntary like tapa we don't have to do we could say that okay i have to work and because i have to work so that is my austerity 
well no you are working for your that's more like that working for your mm, physical survival for your family survival you can call it austerity but that's mandatory there's some that's not voluntary mm-hmm. so dana charity has to be voluntary i want to audio on saying that we said that we should use we should give 50% uh, proposal we should give significant percent of our lakshmi for charity this is what is it my whole family is devoted so i am giving my entire lakshmi to my family so 100% charity <laughs> <laughs> well <laughs> no taking care of your family is a responsibility that's mandatory responsibility so that cannot be called as charity mm-hmm. isn't it Hmm. So then, then, then we return to the environment, and that is through yagya. So, when you do fire sacrifices, through it's not just a simple ritual of fire sacrifice. The fire sacrifice conveys something. The Rig Veda it is said that hmm, Devanam Paramo Vishnu. देवानाम अवमो अग्नि अवमो इज द लोवेस्ट अग्नि तद अंतर सर्वदेवता ना वेन यू से अग्नि इज द लोवेस्ट दैट डज नॉट मीन द लीस्ट इन पॉवर वॉट इट मीन्स इज इज द मोस्ट एक्सेसिव सो अग्नि इज द मीडियम बाय विच आवर ऑफरिंग्स गो टू ऑल द देवतास so vishnu is the highest and i mean that in the sense that vishnu is transcendental in one sense vishnu is the least accessible for everyone that's why when the devtas are in trouble they go to brahma brahma prays to vishnu in all of us know the story and then at that time when brahma prays even brahma ji generally doesn't see vishnu he hears a voice either it's a voice that everyone hears or more often it's a voice that he hears in his own heart so vishnu is very far away but agni is considered to be a means by which the sacrifice that we offer by which what we offer goes to the various devtas and ultimately to vishnu now in modern times most people for them the idea of fire sacrifice hmm, it's either sensational or it's stupid sensational means that how oh, the idea of lighting a fire sacrifice and <coughs> chanting mantras and coming there and seeing the fire spread it's 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 bizarre it's strange now when the first time prabhupada did a initiation and they had a lower east side they did it they had a fire sacrifice and the neighbors called the fire alarm <laughs> there was a house was on fire <laughs> And actually, the firefighters came and they said, "We have to extinguish. They cannot allow this fire. Said, this is a sacred thing. No, we can't allow it." So they just didn't comprehend it. So fire sacrifice can seem very sensational. Or for them, some people say, "You know, what is this? You are taking nice food. You are taking nice ghee and fruits, and you are putting it in the fire." In Europe, once Prabhupada was doing a fire sacrifice for the initiation, and he gave all the devotees bananas. and they sat through the whole set proper gave lecture and they did the yagya and they think when can we eat the banana when can we eat the banana and finally the proper said put the banana in fire and <laughs> <laughs> what <laughs> this is not ready to do that <laughs> so this is this is so delicious we were holding it for so long we think when will we eat it <laughs> so they just couldn't figure it out so the material i it might seem that it's just a waste And yes, it can seem to be a waste, no doubt. That material life, the vision is there. But the thing is that if we consider that fire is a deity, if fire is a deity, then what will happen is fire acts as a means of exchange. So through the fire. So through fire, our offerings go up, and then blessings come down. The blessings may not be seen immediately. Traditionally, when the fire sacrifices were performed, there were mm, three levels of success. Mm. 
successful fire sacrifice. The first is that just the completion itself. If the fire sacrifice itself was completed, it, it is such an auspicious activity that its completion itself would be considered a form of success. And that's why you may have heard that when Vishwamitra Muni came where to, to the Shat Maharaj's palace, he was saying that the demons are interfering with our performance of sacrifice. And when, when Lord Ram went there along with Lakshma, he was guarding the sacrifice. So the idea is that the demons understand that if sacrifices get completed, then auspicious forces gain strength. And then that means they will threaten us more. So that's why they wouldn't let the sacrifices get completed. So completion itself is considered a one level of success. The second level of success is that the, this is the appearance of, it's like we could say that the priests or special people see higher beings. So the higher beings may give some, come to the pot and give some pious sun, or the higher beings will just come and smile. The priests can see them. The highest is where everyone sees them. Hmm. Now this was extremely rare. The sight of the devata, the sight of the celestial beings, it was extremely rare when sacrifice was performed. But the idea is sacrifices, even its completion was considered to be a success. Um, it's basically the sacrifice. So what is happening? It is the celestial beings, the universe and the gods, and they don't need the physical things from us. These are material things. But when we offer those through that, through that expression of offering, the intent and the result of that leads to the higher beings getting satisfaction. They get satisfied by that. And it's like Prabhupada comes to compare Yajna to a tax. And now when Yajna he will compare to a tax. Normally tax we pay to our state, Yajna is paid to the cosmic state. So state means not the state in the state in the nation basically. The word state is used as a representative of a nation also. So now when this yajna is performed, at that time, the point is the performance of the yajna would please the devtas. And sometimes they would themselves appear. Sometimes we just pay a tax and that's over. Sometimes, uh, if a substantial tax is paid, then mm, there is a special notice by the court. Okay, this person is law abiding, this person is paying the tax. So the devutas will sometimes themselves, the higher beings would come and reveal themselves. The point we are making by talking about this is that this means of exchange, this may seem far fetched to us, but you are taking things, just putting in a fire and turning into ashes. But you know, if you today, you consider a credit card or a debit card. Somebody goes to a bank and in the bank counter, that person put piles of money. They put piles of money and in return they just get one card. A person who has no idea of how digital currency works, they say, Hey, you went with so much money and you just got one card. What is the use of it? And nowadays, with uh, with our phones, you don't even need a card. You can just say you have an image of a card. Isn't it? You give $10,000 and you get one a picture. See, you cheated. You just lost all the money. And the point is that the form of exchange can seem bizarre at times. Bizarre means unbelievable. Ah, so, to a person familiar with digital economy, our digital exchange has seemed bizarre. But the principle of exchange, that is universal, that is familiar. So Yajna is basically meant to signify the principle of exchange. Okay. 
So, Krishna talks about how yajna can be done in the three modes. Similarly, dana can be in the three modes. Similarly, tapa can be in the three modes. So, look at that. Let's look at this. First, he talks about dana. Then, when yajna is being performed. So, let's look at this verse. Mm, which one should we look at? Yeah. Abhis. Mm. A phala akang shibhir yajna. That when one sings, sees phala, seeks phala, but without akanksha, without, without the ambition for results. Vidhi dishto ya ijjate. That means that this is what is ordained by scripture, therefore I should do it. Ya ijjate. So, afala kangshi bhir yajyo, vidhi dishto ya ijjate. Ijjate means to worship. Vidhi means the higher authorities. Dishto means told, disha. Yashtavyam eviti mana. Yashtavyam means this is the yajna which I have to perform. Yashtavyam eviti mana. Yashtavyam eviti mana. Samadhaya sa sattvika. Samadhaya sa sattvika. So this is this is my duty to perform it. I got so much from nature, from the universe, from the deities, from God. But I have to do this yajna. And when somebody does this, then that is understood to be satyogana. But on the other hand, somebody might do yajna for getting destructive power. So if it's tamasic against, that one performs yajna in a very inappropriate way. Well, then that yajna is considered to be inauspicious. So sometimes uh, there can be all kinds of improper sacrifices being done. That when those sacrifices are done, that's not that's not good. So animal sacrifices were done in the past. So the test of the animal sacrifice would be the animal would come back in a new body, higher body. But the animal sacrifice would not be performed properly. That means the priest would not chant the mantras properly, the priest were not pure, the rituals would not perform properly. Then that would just amount to animal slaughter. So vidhihinam, so you're not going to full words. So if, if the sacrifice is not performed properly, that is tamasa. Now Krishna will talk about yajna, he will talk about tapa, he will talk about dana. So now what has happened is, in Kali Yuga, because Kal, now Kali Yuga, does it exist all over the universe? Or does it exist only in earth? What do you think? Does Kali Yuga exist on the earth or in the universe? Okay. Now, in many questions like this, the safest answer is both. <laughs> but it's not true over here, sorry. Actually, the cycle of ages, Sattva Yuga, if you can Sattva Yuga, Tita Yuga, Dapari Yuga, Kali Yuga. Where does this exist? Earth, isn't it? You know? The time flows differently in other places. Isn't it? So, the yuga, Kali Yuga exists only on earth, it's not in the heavens and other places. So what happens is, in the past, the Kali Yuga is considered to be like a contaminated age. So the earth is here and above this is the heavens, above below this is the lower planets, all of them. So in the past, there will be a lot of uh, interplanetary travel. In the sense that devatas would come to the earth, asuras would sometimes come here, the humans would also go. But in Kali Yuga, because Kali is a very destructive force, so Kali Yuga is considered to be a dangerous age. And that is why in Kali Yuga, the earth gets quarantined. Like in a pandemic, there is a red zone and you are not allowed to become, people to come in from there, people to go in there or people to come out. That's why in this union, in this age, the exchanges between Earth and other planetary systems, they become very rare. Hmm? That is basically to prevent the toxic influence of Kali Yuga to go to other places. So why am I talking about this over here? Because of this, yajnas are very difficult to first of all perform in Kali Yuga with lack of resources, and then 
to get the result of those yajnas in terms of fire sacrifices. Devatas will practically never be visible over here in Kalimba. So, yajnas are not so much like the principle of sacrifice is there. And when we chant the holy names, our consciousness can be thinking of a hundred things, but it chooses to think about Krishna. So, that is sacrifice. So, the principle of sacrifice is there, but the specific act of fire sacrifice is not there so much. You remember in the fourth chapter we discussed how sacrifice can be in so many different forms. Krishna tells Arjuna that even the, the fighting on the war field is like a sacrifice. At the battlefield is like the Yajna Kunda and the Kauravas are the Ahuti. So basically when you talk about sacrifice, I talk about the sacrifice, there is the principle and there is a specific. The specific can be like a fire sacrifice. It's a one particular way of performing sacrifice. But the principle is that is we give something for a higher cause and that we have to do. Now how does one do it? If one does not do it at all, one does it improperly, that will be disruptive. So this is so this is yajna, but I'll not go too much into yajna right now. But let's focus on dana, sorry, tapa and dana. Mm -hmm. So you look at these verses. Now bodily austerity is fairly simple, now Let's look at that. I'll not go too much into it. Deva Dvija Guru Pragya. Deva Dvija Guru Pragya. So Deva is the, the, the God and the Devatas. Dvija is the Brahmanas. Guru is of course the teacher. And Pragya is any wise person, wise people. The, this is Poojanam. Poojanam means respect. Shaucham. Shaucham means kindness. Arjavam is being straightforward. Brahmacharyam ahimsacha. So that says, Shariram tapauchati. This is the austerity of the mind. Is it true? Austerity of the body. body. Now, why is this considered austerity in one sense? Because it's very easy to become angry. It's, it's very easy to become violent. See, men generally become physically violent. Women become verbally violent. You know, women can be, I did not to criticize women in particular, men can also be verbally violent. But women can be malicious gossipers. So, when they start gossiping, oh, this person did this, that person did that, that person did that. And especially in, among women there is a lot of obsession being, being super thin now quite often it is not that men judge women for not being thin it is women only judge women the body shaming that is the whole term that is their body shaming it is mostly done by women due to other women oh, you are overweight you are overweight you are like that so the point i'm making is that this tendency to himsa is there in everyone now, women may not be so physically violent. In movies, they are. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the, what they want to call current of it, the girl boss, they call it. You know, the woman who can be as violent as a man. Women can beat up a man. Well, that's a fantasy. Some women might be able to beat up some men. But generally, biologically, men, men are stronger. But the, the point I'm making is, violence is there as a tendency in everyone. It just comes in different ways. And similarly, all other things, they are a natural tendency of a person to be disorderly, to be disruptive, to be disrespectful. But we train ourselves to be respectful. So, Poojanam Shaucham Arjavam Poojanam Shaucham Arjavam Brahmacharya Mahim Sacha Brahmacharya Mahim Sacha Shariram Tapa Uchate Shariram Tapa Uchate It's interesting about uh, this male female differences. Psychology and sociology found a lot of differences. See, it's like women attempt suicide more than men. Men commit suicide more than women. How is that possible? Women attempt suicide more than men. Men commit suicide more than women. <coughs> no, yeah, well, women, because they are often quite emotional, so 
that the emotions carry them away emotions carry them away and then oh i'll commit suicide i'll end my life now men are not so emotional but men are not that afraid of physical violence and that can come to themselves so when they become violent <laughs> so at the end when suicide happens women commit suicide men commit suicide both are there but broadly the statistics seem to indicate that the attempts are numerically far more women attempt suicide without being successful when men attempt suicide they are successful <laughs> 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 so now successful suicide is a paradox, you know. <laughs> but so he says that is the suicide is the only activity where failure is a success. <laughs> you fail at it, then you survive. That is a good thing. <laughs> so now Krishna talks about austerity of the body, then he talks about austerity of speech. Anudvega karam vakyam. Vakyam means words. Anudvega karam. Don't agitate. Don't, your words should not agitate others. Satyam is truthful. Priya is pleasing. Hitam is beneficial. Chayat. So, Anudvega karam vakyam. Anudvega karam vakyam. Satyam priya hitam chayat. Satyam priya hitam chayat. Swadhyay. Swadhyay is self-study. Abhyasanam chayva. Now self-study can be basically I can just study in my mind. Now, it, you know it's interesting in the past books were not very easily available. So before the Gattinbar went into the printing press and then the books came about before that reading was never an individual activity. It was a social activity. That means one person would read aloud and others would listen. Even now, you might see uh, uh, Tulsi Ram Chaitmanand is Parayan, so somebody is reading it, reciting it, everybody sits and listens to it. So, the idea of reading in the mind, it is a modern idea. In the past, reading meant reading aloud. And you can also see this actually sometimes if your mind is very distracted. Just try reading aloud. It's so much calming and so much absorbing. It's substantially slower. And there's much that we have to read which it does not require that level of slow reading. But if you find that if you're sometimes you're feeling very sleepy when you're reading, just try reading aloud. Of course, not so loud that you disturb others. But it is actually very just like we say chanting aloud is better than chanting in the mind. So reading aloud is better. And sometimes we do it also when, say when you have a group reading session. That's what you do, you're reading aloud. So that is actually Swadhyay Abhyasanam it is recitation of scripture, reading aloud of scripture. So that is austerity of speech. Now it could mean we read aloud, it could mean remember and recite, it could be we recollect. So basically we use our tongue to recite scripture. These are all Swadhyaya Bhyap Swadhyaya Bhyasanam Chaiva. Swadhyaya Bhyasanam Chaiva. This one mayam. One mayam is of the speech. Tapa uchate. This is austerity of the speech. One mayam. Tapa uchate. One mayam. Tapa uchate. So now here, let's try to understand this austere speech. Now, what does austerity actually do? Austerity, if you consider austerity to be like a discipline. Discipline makes things more effective. If we, if we exercise our body, what will happen? The body becomes more effective. So when we, we are austere in our speech, actually it becomes more effective. And our speech will become more powerful, it will, it will communicate better, it will transform others better. And the, the characteristics that Krishna use of this speech, we can put them into two broad categories. Sensible and sensitive. So sensible is what appeals to the intelligence. Sensitive is what appeals to the mind, basically to emotion and reason. So Krishna gives two characters which are sensible, that is, it should be truthful, satyam, and it should be helpful, <coughs> that is, hitam. And he says anudvega karam, that is, non-agitating. And 
priyam it should be pleasing so the best speech is that which combines all of these things and you could say at the very least our speech should be non agitated but sometimes we may have to speak the truth and sometimes the truth, truth can be harsh hmm? the truth may be harsh but the even the harsh truth does not have to be spoken harsh it can be spoken gently it can be spoken politely it can be spoken, spoken respectfully so speak in non agitating way why non agitating because the world agitates our minds all the time it's better that we don't agitate people's minds more by our speech Now, do we do we have to sometimes speak harsh of course it's not saying see it's if you take only one side of it this is balanced speech but if you take only one side see if you are only sensible or only sensitive if you are only sensitive and not sensible that means or just to please other we start speaking lies then that will become dishonest that will become hmm, dishonest and if you are only sensible hmm, without being sensitive then that will become hurtful and not as hurtful but unnecessarily hurtful <coughs> so if somebody has done something wrong and they have to be corrected you know we can give them this correction in private no need to take their name and publicly shame them so why why hurt them unnecessarily we should need to respect the dignity of every individual now you can say it's just your ego that you felt hurt no <coughs> no we should not if we are dealing with others we should be thinking not that they have ego and uh, i'm and i that ego needs to be brought down we should think that each soul is a part of krishna and every individual's dignity we should be respected so the ideal speech is that which is sensitive and sensible both together and learning to speak in this way is the discipline of speech then krishna talks about austerity of the mind okay we we'll complete this so now austerity of the mind that's an interesting concept and say like what does austerity basically mean it is means mm, the austerity is basically voluntary restraint say if i am fasting what does that mean i can eat whatever i want but i voluntarily choose not to eat certain foods or not to eat any food at all so austerity of speech means i can speak hurtful but i won't speak hurt so i have the power it is austerity was or voluntary restraint of power the power could be the power to eat the power to speak it is voluntary restraint that is the essence of austerity So now there is austerity of mind. Manah prasada. Prasada means cheerfulness, joyfulness. So it is keeping the mind cheerful. Soumya tuam. The mind can go wild. Just when the mind is just calm, it down. Calm. Soumya tuam. Maunam. Now let's first one. Manah prasada soumya tuam. Manah prasada soumya tuam. I normally think of mauna as austerity of the speech, isn't it? Mauna brat somebody has taken. But it's interesting. Krishna is putting austerity. Mauna is austerity of the mind <coughs> because what happens is that it is relatively easier to silence our mouth, <coughs> but our mouth may be silent, but our mind may be screaming. This person did this, this. The world is like this. People are like this. This is like this. You are so terrible. So actually, to get the mind to become silent, yeah, it's not easy. But that is austerity of the mind. Most people, if they can't silence their mind, and because the mind is making so much noise, and they want to get away from the mind, so they turn on a TV and watch that noise. So the outer noise often is a way to distract oneself from the inner noise. At then atma will get rah self control. That is, the mind will come up with many urges. Sometimes there is some pleasure in just fantasizing some pleasure. 
but restrain that. And bhava samshukya. Think of things that are purifying. So maunam atma vinigraha. Maunam atma vinigraha. Bhava samshuddhi rityeta. Bhava samshuddhi rityeta. Tapo manasa muchate. Tapo manasa muchate. This is austerity of the mind. So I'll focus only the first part here. Manaha prasada. Manaha prasada means prasada is cheerfulness or satisfaction. And the key to cheerfulness, key to be cheerful is to be grateful. And how can we be grateful? See, in life, there will always be two categories. Things we have and things we don't have. Now, now, here I just depicted them both of them as more similar size. But the things we don't have will always be more of the things that we have. And if we look at the things that we don't have, we will be dissatisfied. If we look at the things that we have, we can be satisfied. So consider for example, so suppose after this um, program, there is Prasad. It's Ekadashi today, but you have you have cooked food here, isn't it? So no, no need to suppose Prasad is there. But suppose there is a feast, a special kind of feast. So in that feast, everybody is going to get a different sweet. Say in your plate there is gulab jam, in your plate there is jalebi, hmm? in your plate there is basundi. In your plate there is peda, in your plate there is barfi, in your plate there is khaja, in your plate there is so many things like that. So now in my plate there might be some sweet, some dish. But oh, I am taking that some dish and it is delicious. I am eating it but I am looking at what is in his plate. And what is in his plate? What is his plate? Now I will be eating the some dish but it will taste like chalk. <laughs> Why? Because my consciousness is elsewhere. So now, if we think of it in terms of food, it seems ridiculous. Why can't you eat your own sandesh? But we all do like this. You know, there are all of us have things that are right in our life, things that are good in our life, things that we do have. But we all look at the things that we don't have, and we let our mind become agitated. So. In one sense, keeping our mind satisfied, that is an austerity of the mind. Consciously choose to look at the things we have, not at the things that we don't have. And the more we are looking at the things that we don't have, the more our mind becomes dissatisfied and the more the Vegas within that increase. And unfortunately, we live in a world where advertising is all about showing us not just the things that we don't have but how that even the things that we have there are out there things which are better than what we have I have a phone but okay you have iPhone 11 there's iPhone 12 so what happens is it's the, it's the advertising industry is basically a dissatisfaction creating industry. And in fact, the, they say that the fuel of the consumer economy is custom is consumer dissatisfaction. Hmm? It, it's to the extent consumers are dissatisfied, they buy something more. And that's why you know, we will never see advertisements for rice dal sabji chapati. Because those are necessities. People are never going to buy them. But so the, the nature of the world is that the more we look at the things we don't have, we will be dissatisfied. And consciously making that endeavor is very helpful. So we can ourselves think of you now what are the things that we look at that causes us dissatisfaction and try to minimize it. Consciously make a list of what do we have. So 
And if you have heard this saying, count your blessings. But it is not just count your blessings and then make your blessings count. That means what? Count your blessings means write down your blessings. And then when we feel dissatisfied, consciously look at our list. And sometimes just writing a list is not very helpful. We have to describe to ourselves, why are these valuable? Why, why do I consider this to be a blessing? What is so special about this? Write it down. And then when our mind starts feeling dissatisfied, then don't just read the list, but read the description. Oh yeah, this is good because of this, this, this. And then you feel a little dissatisfied. So, our mental, mental energy, if we can continue gratitude, we will find that gratitude is like almost, it will, it seems to multiply our mental energy. What do I mean by that multiply our mental energy? That so much of our mental energy goes in craving for this and resenting this and feeling unhappy because of this. If we just cultivate gratitude, we'll find our mind will be so much more available for us to focus on the things that we want to do. If you go to a class, and you have to wait to go in the class, and just before we enter the class, we see, hey, our, our friend has got the latest version of the phone that I wanted to get. And oh, why did that person get it? So we get agitated. And then once we get agitated, just can't focus. So gratitude is a simple way to conserve and increase our mental energy. That's how, that's why it's the first austerity of the mind. Now after that, Krishna will describe after that, um, that these austerities can be performed <coughs> in goodness, passion, ignorance. Then Krishna will talk about charity also. I'll take this last point and then we'll, we'll add, add, add two more points we'll take. <coughs> Krishna says that charity can also be in goodness, passion and ignorance. So let's see how it can be goodness, passion and ignorance. Adesha Kali. Adesha means not at the right place, not at the right time. Yad Dhanam. The charity is good. Adesha Kali Yad Dhanam. Adesha Kali Yad Dhanam. A Patri. Yes. That means an unworthy person. So Adesha Kala Patri is a standard. Contextual consideration. Apatre bhyascha diyate is given. Apatre bhyascha diyate. Apatre bhyascha diyate. Asatkrutam. Asatkrutam means satkruta is actually some kind of sacred invocation, some kind of uplifting activity run there. So if it is not involving any kind of connection with the higher reality, connection with the higher purpose, avagyatam, and especially it is given very disrespectful. You make the uh, receiver of the charity feel very bad. You know, you are such a beggar. You, you are such a parasite. You need these things. You are asking for these things. Take a job, you loser. You don't do that. You are depending on me. So when you make it, people feel, feel bad when you charity. Avagyatam. Avagyatam. Then that is. Yeah. So asatkritam avagyatam. Asatkritam avagyatam. Tat tamasam. That, that is tamasam udharata. It is said to be in the mode of ignorance. Tat, no, it is said to be in the mode of ignorance. Tat tamasam udharatam. Tat tamasam udharatam. So now what does adesha kaleya dhanam mean? So normally we would consider charity to be a good thing. <coughs> yes, it is a good thing. But like everything, the action good or bad action is to be judged not just by the action. Have I talked about these two kinds of ethics? There is ethics which are contextual and ethics which are categorical. So categorical means that we look only at the action. If the action, the charity is a good action. Not giving charity is bad. So that's categorical ethics. This is Categorical ethics means what? These are two tight categories. This is one category and this is another category. Either something is right or wrong. Speaking truth is good, speaking lies is bad. That's categorical ethics. But in real life is much more complex. 
there is the intent with which the action is done and there is the consequence of the action. So if you consider all these three and then when all these three are considered this is contextual ethics. So for example, as I said, speaking of truth is good, but some rioters are out to target a particular community and our friend is from that community, that friend comes to our home and bangs on the door, please save me. And then we hide him in the basement and the rioters come and they bang on the door. Is he here? What should we say? Satyami, I'll speak the truth. <laughs> well, speaking truth is good, but the consequence will be that life will be lost over there. So, when you decide what is right or wrong, we can't just decide based only on the action that is being done. It's what we do before and what we do after. Both are important. Sorry, both, not both, both. Why we are doing it and what will happen after that. All are important. Intent, content, consequence. So, when charity is given, when it is without consider of time, place, circumstances, without consideration of time, place, circumstances. What that means is, that we are not considering what would be the consequence of charity. So for example, if somebody is a drug addict and we give them money in charity, what are they going to do? They are going to only take more drugs and it's only going to cause more harm. So broadly speaking, see there is, uh, politically there is the right and the left. Have any of you heard this word, right and left? What do they mean according to you? Rights are the conservative. Yes, rights are the conservative. And the left are the? So-called liberals. Liberals. Okay, but what does it mean practically? Okay. Being in the, those three modern era, following the Following the past. past. Okay, so that's a good way of looking at it. See, basically, in every society, there will be some hierarchy. Hmm? There are people at the top, people at the bottom. Hmm? Every society will have that. So, right and left are basically concerned with hierarchy. There is people at the top, there are people at the bottom. And the number of people at the bottom will always be more. Hmm? So, the this is basically society. Now let's put this way. So the, now the right is concerned with what is right in the hierarchy. That this system has worked in the past. Human society has survived. Now many people say, oh, the caste system is such a terrible discriminatory system. And yes, caste system is terrible, it's discriminatory. But if the caste system had been so terrible and so discriminatory, then why is India the most resilient civilization in human memory? You know, the Egyptian civilization, the, the Chinese civilization, the Aztec civilization, the Assyrian civilization, all the ancient civilizations are gone. Why is the Indian civilization still there? There must be something good about it all. We are not saying the caste system is good, but there must be something good about it. So the, so the right it's concerned with what is right about the existing system. Now the left is concerned about who are left out by the existing system. So the existing system, there's a hierarchy and some people get left out and that happens. Some people get discriminated against, some people get a sideline. So ideally speaking, a society requires both the right and the left. The right makes sure that we preserve what is good from the past. Hmm? The left looks for, okay, from the past, whatever you got, has that affected some people negatively? And how do we take care of them? So right and left both are required, ideally speaking, in society. But quite often, now, now what happens is, hmm, the right's idea is, this system has worked and the system is working. So one of the common statements in the right is that traditions, any kind of traditions, they are experiments that have worked. 
this is something which has been done for hundreds of years and people kept doing it because it did something for them, otherwise they would not stop doing it. So we should respect them. And that is true. So the system itself works. That's the idea of the right. If it's not working for some people, then they need to buckle up. They need to work harder. And then it will work for them. The left says, no, the system itself is wrong. The system needs to be changed. So basically, the right is fo right focuses on individual responsibility. And you, know, you should work harder, you will succeed. The left focuses on social justice. Society is unjust, society is unfair. Society needs to be corrected. So now why am I talking about this? This left ideology has become quite influential across the world. Although communism collapsed spectacularly and disastrously, but the left ideology is still very much there. And the left ideology has this idea that, you know, that those who are those who have less power, they'll be discriminated against, and therefore they should be supported. So, for example, in the West, there are many countries which are called welfare states, where the idea is, you know, if you don't get a job, it is society's fault that society is not giving you satisfactory employment and therefore rather than you needing to search for a job it is the responsibility of the state to pay you maintenance and many countries the employee unemployed get a check from the state every year every month every fortnight so now okay if somebody is having difficulty they need to be supported nobody should starve and die but what happens if this goes further and then people just don't want to work? That's what happened in the pandemic. See, uh, the American government, what it did was it just gave, it just printed a lot of money and gave a lot of money to people. They said that you don't have to work, you stay at home. That way you'll be safe. But then people started staying at home and they don't want to come to work only. It becomes a big problem for the economy afterwards. Society can't be sustained that way. Now, that's bad enough. So give charity to the unworthy means, see if somebody is sick or somebody is having some problem because they can't work, then they should be supported. But if somebody is capable of working and they are lazy and then they are supported, then we are only enabling their laziness. Uh, now they say this is not bad enough, see sometimes the road to hell is paved with good intentions. <laughs> mm -hmm. So after the second world war, America was the most uh, successful. See, among all the countries in the world, America is the most geopolitically blessed country. Geopolitically blessed means what? That it is surrounded by oceans. So it's very difficult to attack. And above and below are relatively peaceful and weak countries. Canada and Mexico, neither of them are a big threat. Now, among all the countries in the world, India is probably among the most geopolitically threatened countries. Above there are, you can attack from above. Below also there are so many, there is an ocean, but it's, the land masses are quite close. So, the India has been attacked through waterways also sometimes. So, it, that's why it's a miracle that India has survived for so long. But anyway, the point is, America was quite successful after the first, Second World War. They didn't have as many casualties as the rest of the world. And they sold weapons to everyone else. So then what happened? Many of these soldiers, when they came back home, some of them were wounded. So they decided that they could have funded the families. So you take care of these wounded soldiers. But they decided that we will create separate homes for the veterans. And they will take care of them. And we will take care of them. But by this, what happened was, the intergenerational link that was there, that was broken. Like in India right now, even though the system is that when parents grow old, it is the children's responsibility to take care of the parents. But in the West, this is not the case. Like old age homes are very common. Now, sometimes functionally that may be required, it's unfortunate, it's required, what can be done. But this was all, it was instant, it was government mandated. He says that the family doesn't have to take care of its wounded, the state will take care of. And maybe it was your family may not be able to take care. It's possible, but the same money that you are giving to the giving to the veterans' homes, you no, know, some paid people. How well can they take care? 
isn't it? The family member, normally speaking, they would take it much better. But that's how they got separated. Then after that, yesterday I talked about sexual revolution. Sexual revolution happened, and then what happened is that many times women become pregnant. And then, I mean, traditional society is if somebody becomes pregnant without marriage, that's considered to be a shameful thing. Now, but the whole leftist idea is that that women are weak and helpless. So they are victims of toxic men who don't take responsibility. So therefore, society should support them. And if somebody is a single mother, then society will pay for taking care of that mother, woman and the child. And now the result of this is twofold. Men get further incentive for not taking responsibility. Isn't it? Even if somebody gets pregnant, you just abort it. If you don't abort it, it's not my problem. The state will take care. And worse than that, what happened was that if a woman is single and she has a child, she will be maintained by the state without having to have a job. On the other hand, a woman who retains her purity, she has to work. On the other hand, if a woman gets married and has a child, the state will not support. So what happened was, being unmarried and have a child was became incentivized by the state. That may not have been the intention, but that became the result. So, now, it's like uh, in many states in America, if a single mother goes to college, she has a complete fee waiver. Now, it is complete distortion of social values. So rather than the family being taken care, family taking care of itself, it's like the state becomes caretaker of the family. But the result of this is the family bond breaks. When the family bond breaks, then that has severe scars on society. So charity that is to be given, whom do you give the charity to? And what is the effect of the charity? Now, should women be protected? Of course they should be protected. But how they should be protected is by having a proper family. Children should be protected. But how will children be protected? They need a proper family for that. But and that is not there, the, char the charitable instinct might be there, but the charitable instinct leads to chaos. So there is this whole phenomenon of harm causing charity. The charity is done, but charity ends up causing harm. So many of the welfare measures, they actually don't lead to welfare, they lead to even greater harm. And It's a, uh, it's an, uh, so this Krishna calls out, what Krishna calls out, Tamasi charity. There's a, there's one last example against this Tamasi charity. It is like, there are people are drug addicts and they just will take drugs. And what happens is, sometimes they don't have money. So, they, they will buy, they'll steal and they'll buy drugs illegally and sometimes the drugs will be laced with some other substances and that causes health problems. So in many places in America, especially in the liberal states, they say if somebody is a drug addict, you actually can get a certificate from the doctor that I am a drug addict. And then you go to a hospital and the hospital's doctors will legally give you drugs. Now what is this going to do? You are pandering to the addiction. And not only pandering to the addiction, the state is paying for that. But they make a twisted argument that actually, if we don't pay them, if we don't give them drugs, they are never going to get it. They are going to get into crime and they are going to take harmful drugs and they are going to hurt themselves. And then that's going to, we have to take care of emergencies in the hospitals and that's going to increase our cost. So giving people drugs, giving drugs to drug addicts at government expense, they say it's cheaper for the government. In the long run. Well, it may be cheaper in economic terms, but what is the cost in human terms? Isn't it? That the result is what? How can 
what incentive will be there for people to even give up drug addiction? They say, no, we can have programs for them and we can help them. Well, but it's very difficult. So this, what we talk about harm causing charity, charity can be harm, very harmful at many times. Now this doesn't mean the charitable spirit is bad. It's just that the charitable spirit has to be uh, in a company properly. And then after this, it has to be, sorry, the charitable spirit needs to be guided properly with intentions. And after this, Krishna will talk about that how whatever sacrifices we do, there has to be an invocation of the absolute truth. And he uses the word Om Tat Sat. Right? These are, these are traditional ways to con invoke the absolute truth. And he says, if there is no connection with the higher reality, then whatever sacrifice one might do, that is not very helpful. Ultimately, it will be futile. So, in this way, Krishna concludes this chapter by pointing towards the absolute truth. So, his faith can be evaluated through the modes, but ultimately, faith has to point us towards the ultimate reality. So, I'll summarize what is discussed in chapter 17. We discussed how first point is that when Krishna in the 16th chapter gives like a black and white, black and white depiction that the divine and the demoniac. So Arjuna in 17.1 asks immediately, what about those who are in between? Where are they? So the Gita is showing to another example that we need to look beyond black and white. And then Krishna explains that where is their faith? So faith can be understood through actions. And what actions? Actions in terms of what we take and what we give. So what we take is food. So what kind of food do we eat? And what do we give is in terms of yajna. Let's put it this way. We all belong to three circles and what do we take and what do we give to each of these circles? The body, the society and the nature. So to the body we return through tapa. To society we return to dana. And through nature we return through yajna. So then I discussed over yajna as a means of like cosmic tax. So we discussed various levels of success in yajna and the principle is that that the form of exchange is not as, it may be inexplicable, it may be bizarre, but more important form of exchange is the principle of exchange. That the universe is giving something to us, we need to give something back in return. And in Kali Yuga, because there is a cosmic as the earth is quarantined. So the, those sacrifices are not so much recommended in Kali Yuga. But that principle is still there. Then we talk about tapa, especially in body, mind and speech. So with respect to the mind, sorry, with respect to speech, we talk about making the speech sensitive and sensible. Sensible and sensitive, and with respect to um, with respect to mind, we talked about how the mind can be joyful by being grateful, and grateful comes by choosing to look at what we have instead of what we don't have. And then lastly, we discussed about dana. And how there can be harm causing charity. When can it cause harm? If you don't consider the full context. I guess, uh, so we have to not just look at the action, but also its intent and its <coughs> consequence. So when, when charity encourages irresponsibility hmm? then that is tamasic charity that is destructive charity harm causing charity we give various examples of how 
facilitating drug addicts or facilitating single mothers. Now, all these things, uh, those are Thomas charity. Now, that doesn't mean single mothers should not be supported. Of course, if they are there, they should be supported. But, the, but that should not come at the cost of the disintegration of the family. Oh, that's one couple, I'm, I'll conclude this. Thomas charity, one more example. You know, I stayed, when I got to America, in one city, I stayed in one couple's home. And they called me, both of them. And husband and wife says, you know, Prabhu, we are planning to divorce. I said, and you know, both of them are on, are on phone together. He says, what happened? They said, our son has been diagnosed. Hmm? with a severe heart disease and the cost is so much that we just can't afford it. Our insurance will not cover it. So the doctor only told us that if we divorce, then I become a single, single mother and I get custody of the child and because I'm a single mother, the state will take care of the, uh, take care of the expense. And, oh, it's such a terrible thing, isn't it? You know? To provide for the medical expense of your child, you have to divorce. So they said, so I said, so I said you know, it is certainly divorce is not a good thing, but is it that's the only way to save your child? What can be done? They said that we have to actually, so they said many times the parents just act as if they are divorced and then they get remarried, they come back again together. <laughs> but the government has got wise to it and they say, Actually, you have to prove that you are divorced. And how do you prove that you are divorced? You have to not only live separately, but you have to actually, uh, basically, generally, it's the woman who asks for divorce. Men generally don't ask so often. So, so they say the fastest way, the wife was telling me, the fastest way I can get divorce is if I accuse my husband of domestic violence. So now, otherwise, you cannot get a divorce fast enough so that we can get the insurance uh, or the medical expense from the state. That is such a crazy thing to me. Right? I said, you know, this is, uh, this is beyond my pay grade. I said, I cannot tell you what in this case. I tell you, you know, I knew the spiritual master. I said, I'll talk with him and I'll ask him. I, I will talk, I, if you should talk with him directly. So, the spiritual master, yeah, the spiritual master has many disciples. So, I said, I'll go to in touch. But is it, this is so unfortunate that someone has to divorce so that they can take care of the child. So this is like harm causing charity, unfortunately. Okay. So any last questions before we finish? I know we I came late and we don't want to delay your class too much. We'll finish it, we'll finish before 7 30. Yeah. Thank you, Lord, for last my question is regarding that. Uh, when you say uh, that we should ca count blessings um, uh, for gratitude, but I saw that uh, sometimes when we try to count blessing and stuff, it will become uh, mother, uh, even because of so comfort comfortable that we after that we don't, mother, we feel that there is no need to work. <laughs> no, that's not a. Uh, I mean, that's possible. But if we value our gifts, then we understand that we are given gifts that we can share our gifts with others. So, um, gratitude is at three different levels. You know? to, to value what we have. Everybody has some things, but to value what we have, that is the first level of gratitude. Second level of gratitude is to <coughs> value those who don't have what we have. Because what happens is, sometimes I may be, I may be grateful for the gifts that I have, but then I start devaluing and degrading and minimizing those who don't have those gifts. If the wealthy can be grateful for their wealth, but they look down on the poor. So this is what happened in um, that in Christianity there is something called a prosperity gospel. Prosperity gospel is a, is a Protestant idea primarily. America was built on Protestantism. 
But the idea is that I am wealthy because I am a good person. You are poor because you are a terrible person. So my wealth is a proof of my goodness, and your poverty is a proof of your lack of goodness. And actually, this was the idea that motivated the colonial mentality. When Europe colonized the world, they said, "Why are we so wealthy?" That is because God has blessed us. And India, Africa, South America, they are poorer as compared to us. Why? Because those are cursed. And you know, there was a who was it? I think Oscar Wilde or somebody, one of the famous British poets. He said, "You know, all these countries are so cursed, and it is a white man's burden to have to go there and to civilize all these uncivilized people." So of course they they brutalize, they didn't civilize. They exploit it, but the point is that if sometimes when we value what we don't have, we don't value others. So if you can actually by value what we have, value others, then our our gratitude does not lead to pride. But then after that, to share what we have with others, because we value others also. That is the greatest thing. So somebody who has wealth. they can just give charity that's good but if they they create if they have wealth and they create some they will build a company where they can employ other people they are not giving charity but they are sharing the gifts that they have so if i have speaking ability if i have singing ability if i have any ability if i have any gifts i'm meant to use that for good that's where we can the gratitude can stay on yes please being satisfied with what we have and uh, does it like lead to lethargy like we don't yes it can definitely lead to lethargy if it's not connected with a higher purpose see if my pleasure comes from service then i will want to use what i have in service So see, somebody can sing. Hmm? So the singing ability is there. Somebody can sing to gain fame, hmm? or somebody can sing to spread joy. See, a gift in one can be a gift for everyone. If one person has a beautiful singing voice, hearing that voice is a joy for everyone. If one person has a nice artistic ability the art that they make is is brings joy to everyone if one person has engineering ability but they can make something which can bring comfort for everyone or relief for everyone so the idea is that whatever ability i have if i am using it for my own fame for my own prestige for my own power then that is unhealthy i'll never be satisfied and i will always be craving for more But if I truly value what I have, and then it's not just okay, I have and I'm satisfied. I have something I want to use it in the mood of service. So then we will, we won't be, we won't become complacent. We won't become lethargic. So gratitude does not take away our ambition. Gratitude elevates the motivation for our ambition. somebody who is a grateful singer or uh, somebody uh, grateful for whatever they have they will still produce good content but they produce it so that they benefit others so that is gratitude so yes it, can, it is a common notion that gratitude it will this it will take away our ambition it will take away our in, um, sorry take away ambition but that's that's why that is a possibility but actually in bhakti we understand all gifts come from krishna and all gifts are meant to be used for the service of krishna it elevates the motivation for our ambition so i want to compose songs i want to sing songs so that i can become the most famous singer in the world no i want to sing songs about krishna 
about uplifting things so that people can find some joy, people can find some contentment, people can rise, their consciousness can rise up to us. So that gratitude can change our motivation. Okay. So thank you very much. Srimad Bhagavad Gita ki. Hey! <laughs>